Good morning. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church in Waco. Leslie, as you may know, is out of town this past week. She will be back this next week. My name is Jim Eller. Jimmy Johnson invited me to be your parish associate in 2004, and I've been around ever since. I'm a bivocational minister in Grace Presbytery. My ministry includes several disaster response ministries and this church. By day, uh, my jo day job is at Baylor University, uh, teaching gerontology and theories of counseling for the School of Social Work. One of the roles of a parish associate in any good setting uh, when she or he preaches is to mess up enough times that the congregation is glad to have their pastor back the next week. I am likely to fulfill that role for you today. This morning in our call to worship, we need to remember our friends who are in hospice care, several families who are challenged by vir various cancers, surgeries, and other health concerns. Many of us are struggling with grief and loss in this time where for some we have lost the ability to go out and do the things that we enjoy. For others, we have lost people who are dear to us, some from the COVID virus. Please keep those folks in your prayers as well as uh, those who may not be on the church's list, but who travel in your hearts this day. We further need to continue to pray for all those who are serving our country in both dangerous places and here at home. Keep them in their prayer, your prayers as they seek to serve our country. This day, we can also celebrate with families who are expecting new additions. As a community of faith, we celebrate with each one in the expectation of new life. Welcome home, children of God. So before we do our call to worship, do we have chimes this morning from the Steuben Rocks? Do you want chimes or do you want the water? Since you're up, why don't you go first? Okay, so we do have chimes. And I've already muted myself, so tell me if there's feedback, because I hope there's not. One, two, three. enter your house. I will bow down toward your holy temple in awe of you. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness. Because of my enemies, make your way straight before me.
as Presbyterians, we, we believe we bring our whole selves before God, warts and all. Let us pray the prayer of confession together. We confess that too often we stand on the sands of time and watch it flow past without grasping or appreciating the gift of each moment. We can stand on the edge of a new experience and cower. We can pledge into a new experience without appreciating where it will take us. But most of all, we often forget to turn our face to you for your guidance and mercy. We have failed to live the new life you have given us. We have come to you with little or no offer except our own, our own sin, and we seek your mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord. In his name we pray. Amen. Is there a response to that? This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light in him, is no darkness at all. If we walk in the light as he is with the light, we have worship, fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. 1 John 1, 5. Passing the peace. Moving now to the passing of the peace, we're all set. It is time that we get a chance, whether by waving or by uh, talking to one another or using the chat line to say hello. So good morning, First Presbyterian. Peace of Christ to all. Peace of Christ. Peace of Christ. Christ. Christ to everyone. Peace of Christ, first Peace of Christ. Peace of Christ. Peace of Christ. Peace of Christ. Jim Dalton. Peace of Christ. Peace of Christ. Peace of Christ. Peace of Christ. Pizza crust. Peace of Christ, Joe and Amelia. And to you. And to you. Joe. Joe and Amelia. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Mark Heron. Peace of Christ. Oh, peace of Christ, Mark. Peace of Christ. Peace of Christ, everyone. Peace of Christ, Mark. Peace of Christ, Sarah. Peace of Christ from the Bates. All right, Mike. Oh, hey, Mike. Hey, peace of Christ you. to the Bates. Thank you. Hey, Mac. Hey, Mac. Peace of Christ yeah. to you. Thank you. Hey, Bye. thanks. Peace, Mac and Virginia. Peace of Christ, Helen. <laughs> there you are. It's always interesting to try to figure out when the congregation is finishing with peace. I was in a church in Louisville <laughs> not long ago that uh, they had uh, hand, hand sanitizer in each window yeah, well. Christ, and Jim, the pastor and and the because they would get over so and, sanitize and then sit down. Mm -hmm. um, we may want to think about that. <laughs> Going into the future. Uh, Linda Reed, I understand it's uh, your blessing to bring us the uh, spirit box. Yes, I'm hoping that it will work and you guys can hear me and see me because I am outside and welcome to beautiful Colorado. And I hope this is going to be going through to you guys, but I wanted you to see one of the carvings. I hope you can see this carving. Of, this is the first carving. In 2002, there was a Missionary Ridge fire up here that burned 70,000 acres where we had 4,000 firemen and one died. And after the fire, the a sculpture from Pagosa Springs carved each one of 14 of these around the um, park, I mean, around the lake and um, in honor of the people, the firemen that fought. And 
This is just one of 14, and I hope you can see it. And I hope you can hear me. You're coming through loud and clear. I am done. If there's anything, I hope you could see that. Thanks, Linda. That was really nice. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh huh. Thank you. I'll mute myself now. <laughs> Thank you. I responded to the campfire out in Chico, California, after it happened, and. Um, it's devastating to see what happens, but then go out there a couple of years later and see how much has regrown. It's an interesting part of our world to see it go, the tragedy of its going and the lives that it takes, and then to see God bring it back in some small way. What Absolutely. We the aspen are taking the place of the pines. Yep. My friends, will you pray with me? Lord, open our hearts and minds to the power of your Holy Spirit. That is, the scriptures, as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us this day. Our first scripture lesson comes from the book of Ecclesiastes. A few weeks ago, when Leslie was preaching on Ecclesiastes, she read this passage using the traditional words, vanity of vanities. This morning, I will read it from a different translation and hope that my remarks later will make that more clear. These are the words of the preacher, son of David's son and king of Jerusalem. Smoke, nothing but smoke. There is nothing to anything. It is all smoke. What's there to show for a lifetime of work, a lifetime of working with your fingers to the bone? One generation goes and it's on its way and the next one arrives, but nothing really changes. It's business as usual for old planet Earth. The sun comes up and the sun goes down, then does it all again and again, the same old round. The wind blows south and the wind blows north, Around and around the wind blows, blowing this way and that, but the whirling and erratic wind, all rivers flow into the sea, but the sea never fills up. The rivers keep flowing to the same old place and then start all over again and do it once more. Everything's boring, utterly boring. No one can find any meaning in it. Boring to the eye, boring to the ear, what was will be again, what happened will happen again. There's nothing new on the earth. Year after year, it's the same old thing. Does not anyone call out, hey, this is new. Don't get excited, it's the same old story. Nobody remembers what happened yesterday and the things that will happen tomorrow, nobody will remember them either. Don't count on being remembered. This is the first part of the book of Ecclesiastes. Um, and if you have a Bible handy, you may want to peruse Ecclesiastes 1.1 and get the version you're more familiar with that. Uh, but uh, this one was done by a Hebrew scholar that uh, I think has some interesting points. I want to also now read a section from uh, verse 3 of the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, you will recognize it. When back in the 1960s, when the band The Birds was playing this song, I honestly just thought it was a song. And it wasn't until later that someone in my fellowship youth group pointed out that it was a song. But let me give you some remembrance. There is an opportunity, time to do things, a right time for everything on earth, a right time for birth and another for death, a right time to plant and another to reap, a right time to kill and another to heal, 
the right time to destroy and another to construct. Turn, turn, turn. The right time to cry and another to laugh. A right time to lament and another to cheer. A right time to make love and another to abstain. A right time to embrace and another to part. Turn, turn, turn. A right time to search and another to count your losses. A right time to hold on and another to let go. A right time to rip out and another to men, a right time to shut up and another to speak up, a right time to love and another to hate, a right time to wage war and another to make peace. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gospel reading this morning comes from John chapter 5, verses 31 through 47. If I testify about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who testifies on my behalf, and I know that his testimony to me is true. You sent messengers to John, and he testified to the truth. Not that I accept such human testimony, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light but I have a testimony greater than John's. The works that the Father has given me to complete, the very works that I am doing testify on my behalf that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has himself testified on my behalf. You have never heard his voice or seen his form, and you do not have his word abiding in you because you do not believe him whom he has sent. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that testify on my behalf. Yet you refuse to come to me to have life. I do not accept glory from human beings, but I know that you do not have the love of God in you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not accept me. If another comes in his own name, you will accept him. How can you believe what you accept glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the one who alone is God? Do not think that I will accuse you before the Father. Your accuser is Moses, on whom you have set your hope. If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe what he wrote, 
how will you believe what I say? The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Recently on the internet, I discovered an interesting statement. Nothing you have is because of luck or chance. It is all God's grace. I suppose I shouldn't deny luck, even from the internet, which, by the way, this particular piece was referred to as cowboy wisdom. But from the perspective of our Christian faith, there is wisdom in this. Martin Luther defined grace as faith in, is a living, daring confidence in God's grace. So sure and certain that a man could strike his face on it a thousand times. He went on to note, I do not do good things in order to obtain the grace of God, but rather because I know the grace of God I do good things. Three things for us to think about today together. Time, grace, and the impact of stress on our lives of a disaster. Time and grace reflect how we live. The disaster generally arrives often without warning and in the times and location of its own selection. We're currently living in a time of a disaster. Coronavirus has brought us a new world reality. In disaster terms, it is referred to as a national, natural disaster, but I also refer to it as a no-bang disaster as it is difficult to pinpoint when it started for each of us and even when it will end. In a hurricane, we can spot the day and time of the landfall in a shooting, we can understand clearly when someone has opened fire. A pandemic may have origins, but for each one of us, knowing when it will arrive, or even how it will arrive, will arrive, it, it becomes something to discover in our lives. And certainly it allows lots of room for us to deny that it will ever happen to us until it does. A statistic I heard the other day was about a third of families in the United States have been directly impacted by the coronavirus. Like a hurricane, we all believe it will not happen to us, but then it does. So how do we make sense of it? For a perspective on this, I want to turn to the book of Ecclesiastes. The reading that I gave you this morning from the book of Ecclesiastes makes it sound terribly uh, negative toward life in the world. What one has to understand is that it's the only book of scripture that we know that was written by an older adult. Now, does that mean older adults are all negative about the world? It's not a matter of being negative. It's a matter of understanding the context of time in difference of time between younger adults and older adults as they look at a given instance or activity. It is certainly conceivable that many of the others uh, many of the other books of the Bible had influence by other folks. But the author of the book of the Ecclesiastes, as you know from Leslie's discussion, uh, is said to be the son of David, which is to say Solomon, or possibly some of his uh, minions. The author mentions that they are writing this at the end of Solomon's life. Scripture suggests that he ruled Israel for 40 years, and that he was not a young man when David died. Therefore, since the average life expectancy at the time was only in the mid-20s, he was an old man, very possibly in his 60s. At this stage of my life, I still call that a young man, but I guess it's all sort of relative. As Leslie has suggested earlier, in one of her sermons, there is a great deal of controversy as to who wrote the book, since it's attributed to Solomon, that fact alone probably allowed it to get into the biblical canon. That said, we read it 
in most of our very versions of scripture, it is a very confusing text. Is it any more confusing in your mind to have something start out with the concept of vanity of vanities, all is vanity, as opposed to a puff of wind or a bit of smoke, all is a bit of smoke. I would understand that vanity refers to a personality characteristic often attributed to people who think over well of themselves. The controversy in understanding the scripture comes from the translation of this word vanity in he or heben in Hebrew. Most common translation is in fact vanity. However, there is another translation, smoke or even puff of wind. Think a bit about smoke or a puff of wind. Now you see it, now you don't. My first 50 years of my life were spent up in the north around Chicago. And my analogy at that point, this point up there would be remember when you go out on a very cold morning and you exhale, now you see your breath, now you don't. Unless it of course freezes and then it sticks around a little longer, but that's a, a sermon for another time. The, <clears throat> here in the south, we have to imagine it from some other source, but clearly a puff of wind comes and a puff of wind goes very quickly. The book of Ecclesiastes starts out in the first three chapters, challenging us to think about time. There are three tenses to time, past, present, and future. I like to argue there are actually four tenses to time as an educator, past, present, future, and not enough. And if you don't believe in the fourth tense of time, ask any of my students just before a paper stoop. If we see this book as reflecting the writing of an older adult, then almost all his life is behind him or past tense. Time is a funny thing. It seems to pass very quickly. When we look at, then we look back at it, but it moves also slowly when we are looking forward to it. In the, in the music by the birds, the lyricist adds the clause, turn, turn, turn. Turning can move either forward or back, but it also implies motion. While it is not in scripture, this clause, turn, 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 can be helpful for us as we think about these passages. Examples of slow and fast when you think about it. Slow, six-year-old looking forward to Christmas. These days, Christmas is all over the stores somewhere back in October, September. So they start thinking about Christmas. Possibly when you're six, that's as much about toys as it is about the birth of Christ. But you start getting excited. And the more everybody talks about it, the more excited you get. And if you ask that child, time moves slowly and it takes forever to get to Christmas. On the other hand, when you look back at time, it seems to have gone faster. If I say to my students in, in their final year of the program in social work, uh, in, if I say something to them in a August, they talk about all the things that are coming up and how much they've got to do and, and, and how, how, how fast, how, how slow it's going because they gotta get through all of this stuff. But when you talk to them in May, it's as if the year zipped by and now all of a sudden they have to go find a job. Always a good thing. For some, we look back on time. For others, we look forward. When you get older, you have more past than you have future. That's a scary thing to some extent, but it allows us to have some perspective on what has been, not just on what will be. To that extent then, the rigidity of time past it is because it has already happened. When you think about the turn, turn, turn for everything, there's a time and a season. When you look back on something because it's already happened, you know that there's a time for this and a time for that. And if you try to philosophically think about it in any perspective, you kind of feel like, yeah, it was time there and it was time there. And therefore there is something to it. When you try to look forward at that time this, this passage makes it look like predestination. 
there's a time for this and a time for that, and you're stuck into your future with all of that. But remember, this author is an older adult looking back at time. And when you look back, quite frankly, the time has already been, and therefore it is in sort of a box as you look at it. We name periods of times like boxing them into predestination. And that's the third issue to think about is just uh, that was the time in which our children were young. That was the time in which um, we uh, uh, had this great job. That was the time in which we graduated from high school and everything was cool. When we look back, we think about those boxes of time. When you look forward, you don't know what time is headed. You don't know where it's going. And therefore, it's a different perception of time. The secret that we know for older adults and happiness is actually to find some balance between those two. Uh, older adults have plenty of past to rely on and they often like to sit around and talk about those past times. But when one finds balance between the expectation of the future and the remembrance of the past, that's where we find our best happiness, an important piece for us to remember. If we see the work of the preacher of, of Ecclesiastes as reflecting an older adult looking back at life, it has new meaning to the understanding of that scripture. When we look at Ecclesiastes 3, it is not reflecting on some rigid predestined perspective of what could happen in life, but what has already happened in life. This way, the book is far less oriented towards the um, predestined life, but rather to challenges it challenges us to look forward for a discerning life. Of course, the preacher can say, if I have seen, I have seen it all. Don't many of you think you've seen that from time to time? I know in talking to folks who are older, they will often say that, boy, I thought I'd seen it all. You hear it on TV these days quite a bit. Unlike the younger person who might be more naive about things, uh, and still has a lot of the school of hard knocks to attend. Seniors have been there and done that. As I recall it, it may also apply to seniors in high school. That was just yesterday for me. That does not suggest that there is not still something around the corner for each of us to learn. Only the time when we can look back lets us have perspective of what's been for better or for worse. Time looking back can also be filled with disappointment. Put yourselves back to when you were 18 years old. What, what, what were the aspirations of life? Who did you expect to be? What were you going to do? The papers are filled with stories of older adults who have always aspired to go to certain places or do certain things, and sometimes they succeed. The term bucket list seems to have been invented for this. But some of these expectations from when we were 18 can no longer be fulfilled. In my first year of college, I was sure that I was gonna marry my high school sweetheart. Never happened and she died three years ago. Has no chance of ever happening. Other things in our lives could. You could go up and see the house on the rock in Wisconsin, at least after the COVID restrictions are gone. It's a wonderful place to visit. So some things we can pick up on from that bucket list. Some things are closed. That's the nature of time. The book of Ecclesiastes offers the reader an opportunity to examine their life in good times and in times of disaster in a new way. There are four principles that come out of this text that we need to pay close attention to. One is life is in the hands of God. Two, while we can make choices, especially in times of trauma, there are a great many ways that we are shaped by outside forces and the choices of others for which we do not have control. Three, we need to grasp life such as it is. Yesterday is past. We struggle to live for today to reflect God's will, but tomorrow is sadly not even promised. Change takes place in the here and now. We cannot change the past. We often can change the present, which in turn changes the future. But there are choices that need to be made to get to these changes. 
At the end of the day, in the 12 chapters of Ecclesiastes, a key part of the book reflects the fact that God gives us this life. It, it was God who made the world. It is God who sustains the world, and without the world, we would not be here. Therefore, to quote the old Sunday school song, this is my father's world. I rest me in the thought of rocks and trees and skies and seas. His hand here wanders wrought. My asthma is getting worse and I can feel it. This is, this, if this is God's world, then we are players in his creation. We don't own the world. It is his. Paul Tillich, the Lutheran theologian, would suggest that it is in fact the sin of hubris or the wish to be God for us to believe that we can in fact uh, control who we are and what changes can take place. If we are not in charge, then we are temporarily caretakers of a portion of creation offered to us in a piece of Waco, a piece of Texas, a small piece of this great country. We have some responsibility for our peace, but only a peace. We must give the rest to God's keeping. To quote another Sunday school song, he's got the whole world in his hands and you know the rest. If God is in charge, then the challenge for us is to seek meaning in our lives as best we can, even in times of suffering. Viktor Frankl, the Viennese psychiatrist who survived Auschwitz, talks about meaning and suggests that we, might, we must start from the concept of transcendence or caring for others. The older we get, the more there is a tendency to turn inward throughout their day, just managing to get, a, get ahead in the day. This also happens with people when they're quite sick. When you really feel sick, you don't feel like worrying about anybody else, so you kind of turn to your own needs. The older we get, the more there is a tendency to turn inward to get through the day. After all, there are, was a time when I could leap up two flights, two stairs at a time on a sort of flight of stairs. Today, one is pretty good and I have to hope for a railing. Time changes us. As we experience the subtle shrinking of our world through the aging process, we tend to turn more and more to just getting ourselves by. However, if you think about it, the most meaningful aspects of our lives as we look back over it were those times when we were reaching out to others in some way, and that includes God. When I conduct a funeral, I will ask family and friends to tell the stories that they remember about that person. I then listen for those themes within the stories. When we hear consistent themes, those are generally the most meaningful aspects of that person's life. We can do that anytime as it can help us answer the question, what does my life mean? One doesn't have to wait for a funeral to ask that question. This is a challenge for the preacher in Ecclesiastes. He only sees the puff of wind or smoke. He does not see the meaning that life can have as we go forward in this way. The preacher in Ecclesiastes also does not see how to find any sort of meaning in times of suffering, such as those times when we were in disaster. What the preacher doesn't understand is that suffering often links to feelings and events in the life, to the current situation, how we respond to it, it will impact our future. For Viktor Frankl to find meaning in suffering is first to find transcendence, the capacity to care outside of ourselves with others. We need to get outside of ourselves to care about one another. A good example of this is MAD, Mothers Against Drunk Drivers. This group was started by four mothers who had lost their daughters in a tragic auto accident caused by a drunk driver. Instead of focusing anger on the driver, who was in fact at fault, they focus their energy on trying to prevent this from happening to any other members. I believe it can be said that they have been able to find that uh, they have had an impact 
through this ministry. It is normal to have anger at times of grief. It is often included as one of the stages of life. If at times of disaster, we can turn that energy found in anger toward the transcendent, caring for others, we move past the negative feelings towards healing for both ourselves and others. Victor Frankl use, uses in several of his books the example uh, being a Holocaust survivor, when you go around the countryside in public, often you are directed to other Holocaust survivors. At least that was true back in the 70s and 80s. Um, he took a trip to Jerusalem at one point, and he uh, was introduced to a woman who had a uh, bracelet of human teeth. And that, of course, caught his attention. And he asked uh, for her to share with him what it was that that was about. And she said to him, uh, after I was released from uh, the prison camp, I went home, but my home had been given to someone else and they would not allow me in. They did allow me, however, to dig up a little box in the backyard in which I had stored some of my most precious things. In that was an envelope that contained all of the baby teeth for my children. My children all died in the death camp. She said, so I made a bracelet of their teeth so that I could remember them. And Franco said, that still has to be upsetting to be wearing with you. How do you manage that? And she said, I run an orphanage here in Jerusalem. As we take the pain and sorrow from our suffering and turn it to helping others, we remove or we move away from the anger of the event and we find ourselves interacting with the transcendent others and remembering that God is transcendent and God is, we, other people are trans, transcendent and therefore we are enacting, interacting in, if you will, both directions. Whether the disaster you are facing comes from the coronavirus, a hurricane or a tornado, or even a mass shooting, our tendencies to turn inward. We often entertain our own personal pity party. If we can turn out and accept the grace of God to use that energy to support others, we are helping to in part find meaning in the tragedy and the possibility even feeling better about it. This does not take away the death or the material damage of the event. This is still, that is still there, but it can shape how we see that other event or feelings around it. This all starts by giving the trauma to God, knowing that God will support us and grasping on life's potential to allow us to be a part of the solution rather than a part of the problem. Finally, we need to stop being shy about life itself. No matter what our age, even when we don't see where things are going, we need to understand that we need to turn outward to our others rather than inward to ourselves. Living each day is a gift of God. Older adults may be, may, many, for, many, for many older adults, they may know of a time when they recently saw a friend and then they turned around and found out that that friend had just gone to the church triumphant. Tomorrow is not promised. So live to the fulfillment of each day as we seek to be good stewards of God's house. This is, for the preacher, the very definition of wisdom. The preacher notes that wisdom is better than muscle. That's a good thing. I seem to have less of that these days. This is not to suggest the adage, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we diet. While dieting is a good thing, the preacher notes in 12, 6-7, Live life fully while it lasts. It is too soon over. Life as we know it, precious and beautiful, does end. The body is put back in the ground, in the same ground from which it came. The spirit returns to God, who first breathed it, like the birds of the air and all who roam this world. We are born, and one day we will die. So make the most of it. There may be physical challenges in doing that, but there is no age limit on trying. 
We live by God's grace in a full sense of meaning if we can grasp it to be part of the healing in the world around us. The book of Ecclesiastes ends with the following admonition. Fear God. Do what he tells you. Ecclesiastes 12, 13. If you see our lives as a gift of God, with God's word to guide us toward making the most of our peace with that world and following the gifts we have been given, then we have done all we can to be the children of God, just as promised in our baptism. Thanks be to God. We turn now to the affirmation of faith. In life and in death, we belong to God. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in one triune God, the Holy One of Israel, whom alone we worship and serve. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives teaching by word and deed and then blessings of the child, healing the sick and binding up the brokenhearted, hearing with outcasts, forgiving sins and calling all to repent and believe the gospel. Unjustly condemned for blasphemy and sedition, Jesus was crucified, suffered the depths of human pain and giving his life for the sin of the world, God raised this Jesus from the dead, vindicating his sinless life breaking the power of sin and evil, delivering us from the death to life eternal. With believers of every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Pray with me. Dear God among us, while these days are hard in so many ways, we really want to take this time to remember all that we have to be thankful for. The sun came up this morning. Every single morning, you gift us with a reminder of your grand design for light and warmth to this earth. We relish the consistency of the moon and the stars, of tides and the vast waters of this planet. We say thank you for the pleasant aromas and cooler temperatures as evenings arrive again and again and again. And we feel the breezes that give respite during Texas summer days. We feast on the harvests of fruit, fresh fruits and vegetables from this growing season. Thank you, God among us, for these reminders that you are in control, that you know what we're dealing with and you care about us. Please give us the discipline to look for your presence all around us. Oh, how grateful we are for the people in our world who show us what holy love looks like. We celebrate the well-deserved recognition of our own Randy Umstead for his generous giving of time, talent, and professionalism. And we joyously await new babies in the Malavanti and Langdale families, a vivid reminder that life goes on and there is hope to be found in new births. Gracious God, we welcome the opportunity to share our concerns with you as you instructed us to pray for others. Many of us have family members who are ill. We ask for healing and we pray for calm and peace during the pain, anxiety, and boredom that comes with being laid up and being ill. We pray for Christina Gutierrez and her family as they grieve the death of her father. And we pray for so many who are not able to gather to mourn the loss of loved ones and dear friends, 
yet crave an opportunity to be together to share memories and grieve. The world seems scary these days. Viruses, bigotry, hatred, and meanness capture the headlines and get stuck in our minds and hearts. Cleanse us of the obsession to hang on every word repeated again and again. Give us courage to look inward and heal ourselves with the cleansing balm of your love and then turn that love outward to our world. As followers of the risen Lord, we are boldly called to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If we see our lives as a gift of God, with God's word to guide us toward making the most of our peace with the world, following the gift we have been given, then we have done all we can to be, as promised, the children of God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Go in peace, serve the Lord. <laughs>